right. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you today about OLLI, which is another uh, IE system. And my talk is four different sections. Uh, I'll begin with inspiration, which I talk to you about the problems we're trying to fix, and then we'll talk about how we fix them, then we'll see how well we're doing, and then we'll close with some final thoughts. Uh, let's begin with inspiration, and uh, just to recap what we've seen earlier today and in the last couple weeks, uh, we saw a reverb, and reverb is a, an example of a shallow system that doesn't make use of any sort of dependency parts, but uses simply part of speech tags. And what I want to highlight here is the fact that reverb begins by trying to identify a relation with a verb. And they have this, this uh, syntactic constraint here, uh, it's either a verb or a verb in a preposition or some other things, but we start in the middle, look at the verb, and then look outwards at a possibly at a noun phrase to identify the arguments. And then Woe and TextRunner have an opposite approach. They try to start, they start with the arguments and then they work inwards and try to identify the relation. Now I know that um, in actually in TextRunner when it's running online it uses a, a na naive Bayes classifier and likewise with uh, Woe part of speech, but during their training phases this is the approach that they use. Uh, and furthermore what's interesting about Woe uh, is that it has this generalization idea wherein it takes parts of speech and the patterns that it finds and simply throws them away. So if it, says, if it sees preposition in in a pattern, it'll just toss away the in part and replace it with preposition star and thereby have a pattern that works in more types of places. I'll come back to this when I talk about how Ali does something similar. But what I want to point out to you is that both of these strategies make assumptions about relations and about uh, how they're structured and encoded in sentences. And this is kind of what Professor Boss was getting at with her question at the end of the last presentation. Um, but I'll get to that in one, one second. Uh, so both systems output the same thing, which is tuples. And tuples, in, in a way, sort of demonstrate these assumptions in that, first of all, they're all binary. And secondly, the, it's always the case that the relation is situated between the two arguments. Uh, sometimes they're even called triples, which really underscores the idea that we're talking about three things here. The problem is that this, these assumptions about relations, or rather extractions, don't always hold. And so generally the idea of Ali is, let's take the set of extractions for which these assumptions do not hold and try to identify them. And there are four different assumptions. Firstly, relations have verbs. Secondly, there's the ordering of, within the sentence uh, of the relation and the arguments. Third, there's the contiguity assumption that each of these units is itself an atomic piece that isn't interrupted. You can imagine that that tuple thing partitions the sentence into three sections. And finally, that they're non-nested, that a relation can't occur within another relation. Uh, let me give you some examples. So relations are, can definitely exist when they don't have verbs. Here's an example here, and the markup that I'm going to use is to underline the, uh, the relation and uh, italicize the arguments. And so here this sentence says that Bill Gates is the founder of Microsoft without using any verbs at all. Sometimes it's the case that the relation and the second argument can precede the first or any other sorts of variations, as in this sentence. And you can imagine that this is particularly challenging for a system that would be based upon a uh, part of speech that doesn't resort to a dependency parse. So much though the computational requirements of a dependency parse have been maligned, there are is utility in looking at the deeper structure. Se uh, thirdly, there, is, um, there are elements that are non-contiguous. So sometimes a relation, particularly when you have these auxil auxiliary verbs like are and then a, a, a phrase like available at, uh, they can be interrupted by arguments, as is the case here with taxis. And finally, there's this issue of nested relations. There's two ways in which we see relations are nested. Uh, the first, and I could have just as easily replaced this with the sentence that Patrick gave us with, uh, they claim that Columbus discovered uh, some America in 1492. This is the same issue. Early astronomers believed that the Earth is the center of the universe. The truth conditions of this sentence have nothing to do with the Earth as the center of the universe. In fact, we obviously know that's false. They rest instead upon the idea that somebody said that was the case. And uh, in order to capture this fact, and I guess perhaps preserve some of the compatibility with earlier systems, they nest the relation the Earth is the center of the universe within an outer structure which captures the attribution. In this case, uh, believe to signify a how do we know what's, what's going on here, what's the connection, and who is doing the believing. We also sometimes want to make uh, connections between one idea and another. Sometimes it's uh, conditions we impose upon one relation, as in this example, but there are also other sorts of connections, like consequences, or causes, or contrasts. 
And, and we do this oftentimes through clauses that modify other relations. In this case, we see that if Tiger Woods makes a shot, Tiger, oh, I should say, if he makes a shot, Tiger Woods will win the championship. The same idea is, we, is used, we embed the relation, or the extraction rather, within an outer layer that uses the tag clausal modifier, and in this case, how do we know? The challenging thing here is that you'll notice that this, this baggage we're layering on top is getting more and more complex, and, and, and he makes this, this shot, definitely has within it some substructure. I'll get to that later when we talk about some possible improvements. The general idea here is that Ali uses deep syntactic analysis to extract these new relations and uses a new representation when appropriate. Just to take a brief, st brief step back, um, Professor Bach's question was basically getting uh, at this issue of um, uh, how, is, how, is how is information encoded in a sentence. And we're sort of stumbling into this backwards also with R2A2 in that we're looking at, well, there are these tendencies to, uh, to use this sort of construction in the first argument and that sort of construction in the second argument. And if we, if we were to think about communication as between humans as between people that don't live forever and people that have different ends, that, could, uh, that would inform us that um, people are likely to try to pack meaning in efficiently. And that's what we see. If we were to see examples of, of communication like Bill Gates is the co-founder of Microsoft, Bill Gates is a billionaire, Bill Gates a dog named, owns a dog named Bucks, we would think no one in their right mind would communicate like that. Um, but rather, information is packed in in all sorts of ways. And sometimes we use this packing to, to give us emphasis. Like we use the verb-mediated relation to convey the important part, and we use noun-mediated things to convey other sorts of information. So let's talk about how Ali does uh, solve these problems. There's two main modules, an offline learning component and an online extraction component. Basically, the authors of Ali make no assumptions about how information is likely to be conveyed. And the whole purpose of the online learning component is, give me all you got. Give me all sorts of examples of the way information is being captured in a sentence, and I'm going to try and represent those in terms of features in a dependency parse. And then the extraction phase applies those, parts, the, those patterns. So let's begin um, with the first part of, part of uh, the learning phase. It takes a, a, a corpus from the web and actually uses reverb to generate lots of information, lots of extractions, about 110,000 of them. So one possible extraction could be Obama wins the election. And then the bootstrapper says, give me lots of examples of sentences that, extract, that assert this fact. The idea is that if we have a, a variety of different ways that, that this fact is asserted, then we can also come up with a general way of, in which, of understanding how information is conveyed. The problem is that there's no great way of searching for uh, sentences that assert this particular extraction. So what they do is they search the corpus for sentences that have the keywords, the arguments, and the relations. Uh, and this is rather crude. It gives you lots of examples that may not actually assert the, uh, what we're talking about. And so they impose another filter on top of that, which is to look at the dependency parse and to chart a path between these three elements and ensure that that path is of a certain length. Uh, they also check about a hundred of these and it passes their test. So we've checked a hundred out of the four million. We know it's good. Uh, there's four million tuple sentence pairs that result, which is about 40 sentences per tuple. And the idea is then we can generalize. So how, oh, I should say, here's an example of a sentence that we've paired with as our, uh, our running example. Many pundits expect Obama to win the election. So now it's time to create an open pattern. Just a brief review of this diagram on the right. It's a picture of a dependency parse. Uh, in a dependency parse, you'll have the nodes being words, uh, part of speech tags, and the, uh, the edges are grammatical relations of, very, of various sorts. Uh, these edges are directed, and they're one way. Uh, and the, uh, the guiding idea here is that there's a, a head, and it's dependent below it. And so what we do is we uh, chart a path between the arguments and the relations that I've highlighted here. And uh, that sort of gives us what looks like on the bottom. Uh, and then we do things, we modify this a little bit. We annotate a relation, um, the relation node with the word and the part of speech. So that now that's like adding the VB tag right in the middle here. I've underlined the relation. Uh, and this example doesn't have a copula, which is uh, forms of the word to be. But if there was, we would change them all to just be instead of like is or will have or etc. The problem with this thing is it's not very general. Uh, this is a pattern that would be really great if all we wanted to find was Obama wins the election. So the question is, what sort of constraints can we throw away without compromising our ability to detect information? 
What we want to do is have a pattern that's only dependency parse information, not English words. And these English words are lexical constraints, they're references to the language. In order to determine whether or not we can throw them away, we need one more concept. Um, that's the concept of the slot node. And the slot node is simply a node in the, the path uh, along, the, along the extraction in the dependency parse that isn't part of the extraction, something that we don't care about. And uh, once we have this concept, we can then uh, understand the algorithm that they use for determining whether or not we can throw away this information. It's basically four conditions. If there's no slot node on the path, if the relation node is between the arguments, by which I mean uh, it's it, between the arguments in the dependency parse, not in the sentence. Uh, if the preposition in the pattern that we're looking at currently matches the one in the tuple that we got from reverb, and if there's no NN or A mod edges. NN or A mod edges are uh, jargony terms from, the, uh, the, from their dependency markup things. Uh, essentially, they make things more complicated. I can give you an example of that if we have time, but my presentation is kind of long. So uh, if we have, if we can uh, make sure all these four things are true, uh, then we have a syntactic pattern, and if not, we have a lexical or semantic pattern. So here's an example of a syntactic pattern. Uh, these two sentences here are both the same in that they match the pattern at the bottom. Uh, they both have an argument, they follow a noun subject edge, that's what this notation means, follow the edge, uh, followed by a VBD, a verb past participle, and then a preposition, and then another argument. And so for all these purely syntactic patterns, we aggressively generalize. This is what I was talking about with woe earlier when I wanted to contrast them. Woe sort of just says, pretty much in any case, generalize. Uh, Ollie's like, well, if you got these four things, then you can generalize. Uh, so for the relations, we remove all lexical constraints. Notice the word win isn't there anymore. Uh, and for prepositions, we convert them to prep star, which is meant to match any preposition. And the arguments are, are, not even, are, are never used as part of a constraint. So uh, lexical semantic patterns are based on the idea that sometimes um, the content of the lexical word makes a difference. In other words, that there's information encoded using some words but not others. So we saw before this noun phrase, Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates, and it communicates that Bill Gates is the co-founder of Microsoft. But if we apply the same logic to Chicago Symphony Orchestra, we get something nonsensical. Orchestra is not the symphony of Chicago. So the question is, when can we generalize to unseen words uh, without making a mistake. And the approach used in Ali is really simple. Uh, they could, you, you could use many more complicated approaches, and in fact, other people have done so. The idea here is to make use of a, uh, a word net, which is an annotated, um, a database of annotated words uh, that shows relationships between them, like opposites and synonyms and parts of and classes. And they focused on two classes. And basically the idea is this list of lexical constraints, constraints which is formed by like, repeatedly um, using a pattern on uh, lexically uh, constrained items and basically just appending words. So you'll get, oh, we saw it with this word, and we saw it with this word, and a whole bunch. And so you take this list of lexical items, and you intersect it with the classes that we are considering, in this case, people and location. And if the intersection is big enough, in this case, whether it's uh, at least three quarters of the size of the list that we're looking at, use the class instead. Obviously, I mean use people or uh, location as appropriate. Otherwise, just keep the list. There's a couple problems with this. You can imagine if the list of lexical items comprises multiple classes, like literally just the collection of all people in all locations, then neither of the class will be generalized, and instead you'll still have a really big list. But like I said, this is a simple at first attempt. It's not meant to be uh, the best at generalizing here. Here are some examples of what you will get at the end. Uh, so we, we've already seen a couple purely syntactic patterns. That's the first three. Uh, the fourth one is an example of a generalization for a lexical or semantic pattern. Um, you'll notice the type person is bolded. And number five is an example of a, a lexical semantic pattern that hasn't been generalized. And that dot, dot, dot could be hundreds of other items. I, I took a look at all the uh, all the patterns that Ali knows about, and there's quite a few, there's 630, and they're ranked um, by the program in, in the order, or rather with respect to the frequency with which they're encountered in the training set. So the pattern they see the most is, the, is the ranked number one, and the pattern they see the least is ranked number 629. And I was curious to know how they, uh, the distribution of rank as a function of lexical and semantic and purely semant syntactic patterns, and it's clear that purely syntactic are far more common in the training set 
which is good because it means we're accounting for a lot of information with a, with some uh, a small set of patterns that don't have any references to language at all. But the majority of uh, patterns are still lexically or semantically constrained. And you can see that by the frequency count uh, at the other side. I also took a look at the lexical constraints that show up in these lexical patterns. And I wanted to know how long is, that, is the average list of lexical words. What are we talking about here? And you can see there's a clear spike for uh, lexical constraints on NNs, which is a, a noun phrase, I believe. They're huge. Um, I think their longest one is uh, four or 5,000 elements long. Uh, and perhaps there are classes within them that could be identified and generalized from. I can tell you definitely it's the case that CD, which is, stands for a cardinal number, uh, only had the elements one and two. And so clearly we could generalize to all numbers from that. But like I said, that was not the, uh, uh, the focus of this work. So now we have this idea, this set of patterns that are simply uh, collections of features in a dependency parse. We want to apply them uh, during extraction. And um, what we do is we apply a pattern template to a sentence, um, but we want to expand on relevant edges. The idea here is that if we were to simply extract the, the thing connected by the path, uh, we might not capture all the relevant information. Sometimes there's parts of perhaps a clause that are relevant here, like determiners, for instance. Uh, and that may not occur in the, in the tuple or in the, um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the pattern itself. And so we expand on those edges. And this is sort of getting at an idea that uh, other systems have expanded upon, which is that informational units in the sentence can sometimes arise in clauses. Anyways, we, after we, having this, uh, we use the word order from the sentence to make the tuple. So that means sometimes the relation will be before the arguments and sometimes in the middle, at the end, etc. So we talked uh, earlier about this modified representation when we want to talk about nested relations. Um, the way in which we detect them within the sentence, each sort of system has two things it looks at. Uh, for attribution, we look for C-comp edges, which is clausal complementizer. For example, he says that you like to swim. Uh, that you like to swim is a comp or, or he says that uh, is the complement to you like to swim. And um, we only want to talk about instances that reference uh, communication or cognition verbs. Uh, so they look at a, a, a basically a collection of these verbs which, they was, which already existed in VerbNet. And uh, if the verb in question is one of those verbs, then it's attribution. Uh, clausal modifiers similarly have a signature uh, in, term, in the dependency parse. They're marked by an adverbial clause. Uh, but here we're only looking for words that have a logical uh, import to them, like if, when, although, and a few others. OK, time for a demo. Okay, so um, I, th you can run Ollie from a couple of different sources. I found the GUI to be a bit more fun to work with. Um, and let me just open up my file of sentences that I made, which is right here. Ooh, that one did not come over very well. So when I put this in here, um, it's going to start up the program, which actually takes a few more seconds because it needs to load um, the parser module. And uh, this underscores the fact that parsers are really important to, um, to Ali because uh, everything depends upon them. And um, in, th in this example, we're using the malt parser, which is actually not what they used in the paper. Anyway, so up at the top, we'll see parse using malt parser in six seconds and extracted in 0.78 seconds. Ordinarily, you wouldn't expect this time to be quite so large. And if I were to do another sentence, you'd see, in fact, we could do another sentence. Let's just do the same one once more. OK, now it's a more reasonable 0.16 seconds. Um, each relation here, well, right now you see the sentence as it's parsed, which is a big mess. Uh, we can click on an extraction, and uh, we'll see its path highlighted here. And we'll see both the pattern that we use, which is this thing right here, as well as a confidence measure. I haven't talked too much about this confidence thing. Uh, essentially, it's logistic regression with a number of different features, the same as we saw in uh, Reverb and R2A2. Uh, at the end of the talk, I can give you an idea of what some of those features are. OK, let's talk about performance and how Ollie compares. Uh, the first thing you might want to talk about is speed. 
<laughs> I found wildly discrepant reports of speed. Um, depending on which paper you look at, text runners uh, goes from either 72 sentences per second to 2,700. I had to conduce the math here to convert like total extraction time to sentences per second, but you still get really differing reports here. And so it's hard to really reconcile that. What I was able to do, um, oh, and by the way, these Ali sentences per second doesn't actually occur in the paper. You had to look at the readme for that, strangely. Um, what I was able to do is, it, within a paper, if you look at the tendencies, as in like within the reverb paper, it tends to be the case that reverb is better than whoa, is better than whatever. This is what you get. This shouldn't surprise anybody. At the uh, left side, you see the fast ones, the shallow systems. The right side, you see the deepest systems. Uh, for whatever reason, whoa pause is significantly slower, even though it only uses a classifier. I don't know why. What is interesting to me when I ran the program on a whole bunch of examples is that there's a very high correlation between parse time and extraction time. It's like 0.9. Uh, they tend to go well together. Parsing, as will be a theme throughout this presentation, is a major bottleneck to Ollie's success and runtime. The way in which Ali uh, the authors compare the different algorithms is precision versus yield. Now, this is a contrast from precision versus recall. I'll get to how it's different in a second. But for now, let's focus on the method. They looked at 300 set sentences from a variety of sources. And just like in uh, Reverb, they had some two people basically say, was this sentence or was this extraction implied or explicitly stated by the sentence? It's not the strictest standard. You might sometimes get improperly phrased extractions like when you have a preposition or too many nouns in the relation phrase. But if the fact was conveyed, then we'll accept it. And by this measure, at least, Ali succeeds admirably and has much higher area under the curve, curve rather, uh, and uh, pretty much comparable. Um, uh, well, it's just, it's just higher. Uh, as to the issue of precision recall uh, versus precision yield, precision yield simply demands that we can order the responses, which we can using this confidence measure that we already talked about. Uh, but it's not as good as precision recall because it doesn't allow us to detect false negatives. We don't know what we're leaving on the table just because we can order the responses. Unfortunately, doing that would require a much greater effort on behalf of the annotators to actually look at every sentence and say what's possible to, uh, what, are, what facts are here. I'm not really sure why they didn't do that. It would uh, make their later claims stronger. Um, so one of the big things that Ali um, finds important is this now-mediated relation thing, and they were curious to see how Reverb compared with Ali in this respect. And so they took four relations and they, uh, and they ran both of these algorithms on a massive corpus just to see how many uh, examples they could come up with for each one. Ali does much better. Uh, and um, while that's interesting in its own right, with, uh, because Ali has an explicit representation of noun-mediated relations via its patterns, what's also interesting is this stylistic fact about language that emerges, which is that uh, the phrase, for example, Obama is the president, or I should say the, the relation, the extraction Obama is the president, uh, was far likely to have occurred in a noun-mediated uh, extraction than in one in which it was the verb-mediated uh, relation. And that's simply because most people know this. It's likely not to be the main content of the sentence. They also compared Ali to a semantic role labeler. Now, I don't think we've seen any presentations on semantic role labeling. Uh, the object of a semantic role labeler is similar to what we were talking about in IE. Uh, here, the object is to attach a semantic frame to a sentence and to label things with like uh, parts of that frame, like uh, maker or you know product or agent, um, yeah, things like that. Uh, and um, they took 50 sentences here, um, and they actually did this gold standard where they annotated everything, all possible relations. And um, if the the test was if the arguments generated by Ali and the SRL thing uh, matched the arguments of an extraction that was uh, explicitly implied by the sentence, then they would consider it a hit. Otherwise, it's a miss. Um, first, the SRL system performs very well, surprising given that it's not its intended focus. Uh, but it seems to be bad at grammatical complexity. Uh, Ali deals with co-reference better. I'll talk to you a bit about what co-reference is more in a bit, but basically when we have pronouns and sentences, we want to know if they refer to something else that came before, we want to make that inference. Uh, SRL doesn't really have the machinery to handle these more complex uh, grammatical leaps. Uh, Noun-mediated relations are by far rarer if you consider the, um, 
the percentage gain, or the, if you add verb and noun, it's obviously not 50-50, um, given the, uh, the weight there. And they're also much harder for both systems. But the great news is that the union of, um, is, is greater than either system individually, which means that something is happening here. Both are contributing, and that means that both can theoretically learn from each other. So what is interesting is that Ali catalogs the sources of error that it makes. Um, a substantial number are attributed to the parser. Uh, as I said before, dependency ba uh, anything based on a parser or Ali is based on uh, uh, analyzing dependency parse features. And so that, that's a, um, if the parser is wrong, it will be wrong. Uh, the second source of error is from aggressive generalization. We might find this because of the syntactic thing where we uh, too prematurely throw away all lexical constraints. So perhaps they might want to add some more uh, rules for one to do that. Um, miscontext, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, likewise with binary representation. I have a couple examples that are interesting with regard to errors. Uh, so what I did was I actually ran my own test on two different versions of the Wikipedia page for Saturn. I thought it would be interesting to compare simple Wikipedia versus normal English because simple tends to be used less uh, complicated phrasing. And the first example, uh, the extraction, it is flattened at the poles and bulges at the equator, uh, has a couple things. First, there's a co-reference error. It is not connected to the planet, which it should be. Uh, and secondly, there's a conjunction error. Uh, it is flattened at the pole, poles and bulges. Bulges was mistakenly recognized by the parser as being a uh, uh, as being a noun, as opposed to being a verb. Bulges at the uh, at the equator. So in English, bulges uh, can be that which is like protruding up, or it can be when you do the protruding. Um, and so this was a problem, an, an area in which the parser affected directly the the. Uh, the efficacy of Ali. What really should be is the, the case is um, the, you have this list of items that begins with it. So it is flattened and it bulges at the equator. But that would require making a leap about what's being conjoined. The second example, Saturn is the only planet of the solar system that is less dense than water. It generates Saturn as the only planet of the solar system. Um, the word that there actually occurs in multiple grammatical contexts in English. Surprisingly, I learned this while doing the research for this, uh, depending on its context, it has a slightly different pronunciation. Sometimes it's that, and sometimes it's that, or something like that. Uh, I, I have to say it in a sentence for you to appreciate the difference, and you might not still. It's very subtle. Uh, but here, it's not um, being used in, an, in, in the sense that we were talking about earlier with attribution and causal modification. But even so, it, it, the, um, they don't, Ali does not even detect there to be a causal modifier here. Uh, so even if it did and it tried to use that, it would be mistaken. The, the final example, I shot the man with the gun, this harkens back to the issue we talked about before with what belongs in an argument and what is some kind of optional information that we want to include. Is it I shot the man, uh, I shot the man with and then the gun? Perhaps the best would be I shot the man and the gun as three separate things, but that would require changing the representation we have, which is back to this issue we talked about before, the limitations of binary representation. So two observations about language before we conclude. Um, we haven't really talked about phrase-driven grammar, but there is some observations about language that motivate that design which are worthwhile. In English, you'll notice things tend to move in groups. Like, I like ice cream, do you? You don't have to say like ice cream, people will know it. And the fact that like ice cream stays intact is significant. significant. Similarly, I said I would hit Fred, and hit Fred I did. You'll see hit and Fred are moving together. So this observation that things occur in groups is the idea behind phrase-driven grammar, which tries to group things together, as opposed to dependency grammar, which is this is the head of that. Uh, and they both are supported by observations in language. Neither approach is perfect. Ali uses a dependency parser. Some other approaches, like Clausy, use a phrase-driven grammar. Uh, and are based around other ideas about how information is encoded. Okay, conclusion time. First, methodological conclusions. Um, I kept wondering how big a sample needs to be in order to be representative. For our bootstrapping hypothesis, they check 100 out of 4 million. That doesn't seem appropriate. Uh, for the gold standard uh, of tests between uh, SRL and Ali, they look at 50 sentences. Um, every paper seems to pick a different number of sentences to compare. Uh, and um, uh, clearly, if language has many, many features, you would expect a big data set in order to sufficiently like, be representative. Uh, 
There's also this issue that we seem to be getting, uh, like every paper asserts that its system is better, uh, and there's, there's some consensus, but not a super lot between, um, for instance, what we looked at with uh, the performance charts in Ali or in Reverb and other systems. Um, and this might be, would be better if we had a benchmarking standard for IE uh, as in a set, a large set of fully annotated stuff. And uh, grad students are cheap, so we should make use of this resource. Uh, theoretical conclusions, um, the generalization techniques in Ali are too aggressive for the syntactic one, so maybe there needs to be more, um, more constraints about when to do that. Meanwhile, the lexical semantic ones were too tame. There are all sorts of classes that we could have generalized to that they didn't, they just chose not to focus on that. If you'd like examples, you can see this paper. Ali lives and dies by its parser. Uh, it can only be as good as its parser, which is good in, this, in the sense that as parsers improve, so will Ali. Uh, but it's bad in that we're still burdened with this time thing. And if we're going to apply this on a web scale, uh, it'd be greater. It'd be better if we didn't have to parse stuff. Um, representation. I'm sorry. Re re extractions are still assumed to be binary. Um, there are systems that ac can accommodate n-array extractions, like Kraken and Clausy. Uh, and um, they're a bit more recent though. This contextual relation thing uh, is certainly motivated, but it's also flawed in an important way in that we're packing a lot of information into this other tag. You saw in the if example with Tiger Woods that the thing that's attached is practically an entire relation in of itself. And what we're coming to realize is that uh, when you can make these logical connections within a single sentence and have multiple relations, you're almost reinventing the problem of information extraction in a microcosm on this other little thing. And so I don't know whether um, relations can be, uh, the, the entire representation needs to be rethought or whether the output of, rela uh, of information extraction should be not simply relations but also uh, logical rela uh, connections between them. I don't know. So in terms of the future, um, what, I, what I've been learning over the course of my uh, uh, research for this project, um, words are not bags of characters. There's relations between them. We have opposites, synonyms, entailment, classes. Sentences are not just bags of words. There's syntactic structure and semantic structure that we can exploit. The question that I was left with was, are documents bags of sentences? You can imagine a sentence that only uses pronouns, like, he really liked it. And the only way to resolve that co-reference disambiguation would be to look at prior sentences. And so maybe the systems of the future will accept entire documents or at least multi-sentences uh, in order to solve that. Uh, I have a whole bunch of references. Um, the Wikipedia article on that is particularly interesting. And uh, if you work hard, you might discover bugs in the program. And uh, if so, they'll acknowledge it. All right, ready for questions, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Oh, don't stop it. It's very dangerous. Huh? Go away. Can you minimize it? Oh. Not on the text. Yeah. There was this slide with the lexical constraints with the peak. Can you go to that? That one. Yeah, I can understand it. Okay, so, um, it right, so lexical constraint is um, a, a thing in the pattern that, um, in which we have lists of words, and I broke it down by part of speech. So in one pattern, we might have seen a verb, uh, the, it, this pattern occurred with the verbs run and walk and laugh and talk, and that would be, of course, under here. And, that would, and the question is, how long is the list of words that we're talking about? Uh, so the 450... 70 for NN means what? For the it general. means that the average length of the lexical constraint list across patterns that had lexical constraints uh, that were of type NN was 450 elements. Hmm. Long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you kind of, they lose their generalness when you peek under the hood. But most of them are pretty small, uh, and which might suggest that there are more rules to be discovered if the training set was larger. And that's the other question which I had after looking at this information was, if we had had more training data, might we have discovered some other trend going on with these other things? Do you have this plot with the correlation between parse time and extraction time? Yeah, where was that? Mm -hmm. I think that was after this, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 So, doesn't this just mean that parse time is like 
usually a large percentage of the extraction time. Is that what you want to say? I want to say that they're highly correlated. That no, part is that what you actually wanted to say? I mean, parse time is a part of the extraction time? Or no, I, I, I separated them. I measured how long did the system take to parse the sentence, and then thereafter, how long did it take to perform oh, its extraction? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, because it, it. Extraction is what? Mm -hmm. Parsing is just producing the dependency part. Yeah. And extraction is what? What do you call extraction? It? is. Let me apply one of the patterns that I know about of, on the dependency parse graph and extract information. So the parser, I mean, it, you can think of the parser as a modular component to Ali. You could use any parser that you want. So you mentioned um, they didn't use the mod parser in the paper? No, in the paper they used Stanford. I guess for reasons having to do with intellectual property, they couldn't package it with the okay. module, and I was having trouble interfacing with Stanford's parser. Um, mm -hmm. Malt parser was used because it's particularly speedy, and they use that while training the thing because when you're doing it on five million sentences, you don't want to spend a lot of time. Um, and it's possible that malt parser is slightly inaccurate, which is, would explain perhaps the errors that I saw in my training session. Can you go to the second slide of your conclusions? Why can you go the second one? Yeah, actually there was, one, uh, there was one useful thing I could show you. Um, I was going to compare that to Stanford's parse of it. This one or this one? No, the next one. This one? No. No. no it was the right one that you showed. One before. I just wanted to say that grad students are not so cheap. <laughs> 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 they are the most expensive thing in the college fair. Well, we can crowdsource then. <laughs> <laughs> say it again. We could crowdsource. I just meant that it would be nice if we had uh, a benchmark here. And uh, okay, maybe not. Don't sacrifice our grad students, but yeah, but it's really a lot of work. Just a few hundred things. Well, already over the course of three papers, we've done that amount of work. We've just done it in a hackneyed fashion. I, they did the work, and then Reverb did part of the work again, and then. Everybody's doing a little piece of it already. Yeah, but I think one of the problems is you need a perfect definition of what a correct extraction is. I agree. As you don't have uh, any correlation or recall or whatever. On, on for that. And, and nobody has ever really brought up a 100% good definition of what it is. Uh, I, I think that more arguments is more. I, I'm, I'm seduced by that argument that we need to have to separate. We can't have multiple noun phrases in the relation phrase. But. All right. You can also just say. Uh, it, if you're curious, I can show you what Stanford would uh, output for. Um, ooh, I wonder if I have that sentence here. Um, yes. Let me just. I have to. I put this file. I have to look where I put it. Um, ooh, this is weird. Um, Dropbox is not loading. Okay, I definitely have more stuff in that folder that didn't that disappeared. Okay, um, well I was going to show you an example of well I guess I can do it on no machine. That's a little absurd, isn't it? We can browse the web. Oh no. What I wanted to show you simply, I guess I can just tell you in fact that uh, the examples that we've seen here in this particular sentence, uh, Stanford has a different part of it and actually is able to solve some of the co-reference errors. So uh, there is hope on the parsing front. But I guess that's all I have. Shall I stop this thing? Okay. Yeah, thank you again. Thank you.